Welcome back to the Morning Brief. Now, what's your telecommunication experience like? And do you agree that uh, there is justification for increase in, uh, you know, the tariff of the services of telecoms operators? It's an important conversation to have. And we have joining us this morning, Mr. Benga Adebayo is the uh, as is from the Association of Licensed Telecoms Operators of Nigeria. He joins us right here in our Lagos studio. Good morning, sir, and Good welcome morning. to the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning, viewers. Yeah, I guess the direct question to ask is, what is this proposed tariff going to look like? What, what's the percentage of increase? I want you to break it down for us uh, based on what we're paying now and what we'll be paying should this tariff increase come through. Thank you. The, the statement we issued last week was about the state of affairs of the industry. And we spoke about issues leading to um, lack of investment, issues leading to high cost of operations, issues leading to uh, quality of services, and issues leading to um, sustainability of the industry. Um, along the line of that conversation, we did mention the issue of uh, having to do what we call is cost cost reflective tariff, meaning that the tariff that we we charge should reflect the cost of providing services. But unfortunately, that is your price review, gain the headlines and almost making us look lose substance of the main issue. So our concern mainly is on the sustainability of the industry. I can't come today and say to you, let's do a 5% increase in prices 20% increase in prices, and that will solve the problem. No, we are in an ecosystem, and this ecosystem is challenged by a number of factors. Part of it is high, high cost of the business, high cost of providing services. So I'm not here to say this is the percentage of increase that we are looking at in terms of price review. We are only saying that we have a price window within which we have regulatory approval to move. We're asking the regulator to allow us to move within that price band while a cost study is being conducted. What a cost study will do is actually to analyze what is the cost of providing services and what is, it, what is the reasonable tariff uh, when you, they look at the elements that make up the cost. And that's where we are. So we are more concerned about the sustainability of the industry, much more than the issue of price review. Because if you review prices without uh, reflecting on the actual cost of providing services, you are doing a knee-jerk reaction. We have seen the impact of price control in other sectors. I mean, you know what has happened in the energy sector, in spite of the introduction of different zones and bands, it has not really improved on the services. And we are saying that if the fundamental infrastructure is not improved upon, if people do not invest in the sector, we'll have a problem going forward. So based on... Okay, go ahead, Jeffrey. No, no, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up. Yeah. Based on the current realities of what you're spending on operation, what would be the range? You don't have to, you know, peg it as a, at a specific percentage, but what would be the range of increase that would be realistic to make up for what operators are currently spending on cost of operations? Without without going uh, without going too academic about it, the uh, numbers don't lie. So we need to be guided by what the figures say. Uh, we have a price window today of minimum of 640 cobo per, per call, for example. We can move within that price band uh, based on previous regulatory approval, we are only saying that regulators should freeze that 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 point and allow us to move within the current price window uh, while a cost study is being conducted. So I will not be right to say to you to bear one percent, two percent, ten percent, or more increase without referring to statistics and cost study. And that's what the where we ask regulators to do: do a cost study on the actual cost of providing services while that is ongoing. Allow us to move within the current price window, which is between the 640 cover and the 690 cover per call thereabout, and let's see where we are after the cost study. So apparently, uh, what I hear by inference is the fact that doing business in the country has become very challenging, Absolutely. which is why I would like you to unpack the challenges. Yeah. You, you just highlighted them, that you're here, uh, with those of us who are subscribers, we don't know what it takes to run that business. Our response, for us, we want to make calls and those calls must go through, we want, to, we want cheaper data. We know what we want as uh, subscribers. You know what you want as service providers. So help us unpack the challenges. At the bottom of this is high cost of energy. Energy is a major cost. Um, following that is vandalization of our infrastructure and cost of having to rebuild. Also, the behavior of public actors in different states, are high cost of rights of way, uh, closure of sites, of 
on in an attempt to collect IGR um, and other, other characteristics that we explain on the field uh, makes the cost of doing the business very high. Um, today, the industry faces about 49 different taxes and levies across wow. various tiers of government. Um, not only are a number of them not relevant to telecommunication services, but because we are seen as a thriving sector, every state with the aggressive IGR drive sees telecom operator as the, the first call. Uh, in an attempt to collect those revenues, uh, the behavior of public actors is unacceptable. They go to close side, they lock set side, they seize equipment of workers that are working there, uh, and so on and so forth. We have also repeated vandalization across the, across the country, fiber cords, destruction of telecom towers, and without recourse for anyone. Um, in other jurisdictions, when you damage co communication infrastructure, it's a problem between you and the state. But here, when that happens, operators have to pay for cost of replacement and all of that. Uh, the series of fiber costs that we have had and the impact on quality of services, there's no recourse for the operator whatsoever. And part of what we are saying is, other than that, the infrastructure is challenged because people are no longer invested because of the current realities that we face in the country. Uh, we're also saying that infrastructure that support communication services should be protected classify that as critical national security and economic infrastructure. And I call it the first level of protection that you require for any security uh, infrastructure. And then we are also talking about the price right, which of course gained, gained, gained the head headline. And we're talking about the independence of our regulator because all of these elements make up for the operating environment. And that's what investors are looking at. Nobody wants to invest in an environment where you are unsure about price, where you are unsure about regulation, where you are unsure about policy, where you are unsure about vandalization and the rest of it. So these are issues that lead to high cost of providing service. And that's what we are calling on government to look at the state of health of the sector and address this issue Realistically, I know communications. You can't you can't do self help in communications. If you have problem with power, you can buy a generator. You can provide a solar system for the house. You can provide a power inverter. If you have problem with water, you can build sink a borehole. You can sink a well. Um, if you there's problem with energy supply, I mean with fuel supply, government can provide some subsidy. But telecom, there's no self help because it's interconnected. It's interconnected service. So in that regard, we need to look at the issue of the, the state of health of the sector holistically. We can't look at it just by way of price increase or price review without, without addressing all the other factors. You know, the yeah. telecom sector was the cousin in the city that people would tell the power sector, which is like the cousin in the village. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be like your cousin in the city is doing quite well, you know, be like the comm sector. But now it looks like we've come full circle and we're at that point we were saying, well, it looks like the comms or the telecom sector has its own fair share of challenges. And I don't know if you think it might end up like the power sector as we have now if these things are not done. So let's unpack what you have unpacked because each of them needs some unpacking. You talk about energy. Uh, we'll talk about quality of service, by the way, because a lot of people will say, I hope this is not an excuse for you know, the terrible quality of service that they've been experiencing, not just in the past few weeks, but for some as far back as they can remember. But for energy, now, we understand that diesel, for example, the price is coming down. And some say, oh, that's a silver lining. Better days are here. I don't know for you if it's here or they are coming. So speak to us how far that has improved your energy costs. And when I say improved, not increased it, but cut it down. Has that really, have you, have you started feeling that? Not, not significantly, cost? not significantly. Um, when projections are done, you look at it over a period of time, six months, 12 months, maybe 24 months or more. And beginning of last year, this was selling for about uh, 500, 600, or thereabout in the early part of last year. Today is over 1,000. Okay, it was 1,600, now it's 9,200, thereabout. The difference is still wide. And if, you, if a sector like us that powers majority of the, of the sites with diesel, you can imagine the cost. And the pump price of diesel is not the delivery cost of diesel to site. Mm. Because there's also the logistics. When you go to the first region to buy for home use, it's not the same as when you truck diesel to 40,000 sites across the country. Pardon me, to yeah. So if we hear that diesel is being sold 1,100 naira yes. from the source, yes. so that means you are getting it for... Well, if you, even if you get that 1,100, there's delivery cost. In some part of the country, you can't assess, you can't deliver diesel to site without having to pay local taxes and levies. 
And that can be from state government, from local government, from area community development people, and the rest of them. In some cases, when you land the truck on site, they give you a price before you will allow you to offload this diesel. The price is to evacuate. Yeah, 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 yeah to, to offload. So you're saying that the reduction that you experience in that space yeah. is insignificant? It's not significant enough to solve the problem. It's not. And so you see, so sir, if because we're, we're unpacking yes. the unpacked. Yes. <laughs> So that means if you mark it up, yes. so for instance, on the 1,100, as he's yes. mentioned, yeah. I've this. Yeah. By the time you add, add all, all of these multiple taxes or levies yeah. or whatever, are you talking about 2,000 or more? In some cases, yes. In some part of the country, yes. In some part of the country, yes. So at the end of the day, yeah, so a, bit, a little here, a little there doesn't make much difference. Yeah. And the other risk, the other problem, the other problem is that some regulatory agencies, or even the petroleum sector, they are going after telecom providers. So they will say to you that something in the law that says if you have more than 500 liters of uh, storage tank on your site, you have to get a permit, you have to pay a fee and all that. That's also the round of problem that we're facing. So the, the infracos who are supplying this to, who are supplying, they are providing um, support for the industry, uh, who are preparing the infrastructure and they have to fuel their site. They face this problem from time to time. We have a number of cases like this where state agents will say, without this permit from the Petroleum Authority, we cannot allow you to offload. Petroleum Authority will go there to seal up the site because they will say this permit is not applicable and all of that. And in the taxes and levies that we pay, part of it is what is called effluent discharge. And we say to them that what is effluent discharge? They say it's from generator emission. Fair enough. But the same generator we use on sets is what we use in homes and in offices. Why is that applicable in the telecom sector? for example. So on the issue of diesel and energy, the reduction you are seeing on the pump price does not necessarily translate to reduction on the cost of delivery uh, to telecom site. Absolutely not. So at the end of the day, so, the bites are just yeah. too, many, too many bites yeah. on the skin. Yeah. And you see, the other side of it is when we talk about investment in the sector, when uh, these generators have a minimum a useful life. Uh, they run for a certain number of hours after which you have to replace them because they work 12 hours and 12 hours. In some cases, they work 24 hours and then 24 hours. When people stop investing, they will stop replacing those generators. So you can come to a point where some sites are out of power and it even happened today because in some cases you can't deliver this to sites. So sites have to go down. Um, you come to a point where some sites are out of power because of age of generator. And if we are not careful, you, we may have a situation where telecom services become available only at a certain time of the day. And that's why we are saying we must do something now. You don't want to come to a point where service is available in the morning and it's not available in the afternoon and it's not available in the evening. You don't want to come to a point where because the cell side next to you is no longer provided, it's no longer available, you have to go on the rooftop to go and get services from distance cell side. You don't want to come to that point. And you see, if we don't invest, if we don't attract the right investment in the sector, where technology sector, a lot of other sectors are dependent on us, and so this, this spillover effect will be too much. So, so you, you've said quite a lot, and that brings me to the next question. You talked about the need for infrastructure, myriad of taxes, yeah. uh, you know, some practitioners coming after you because they feel that telecoms uh, sector uh, you know, has the money. So you also talked about how infrastructure is vandalized, but in other climes, it is a matter to be solved between government and the uh, operator. But in this climb, you have to deal with it on your own. So what is in the enabling law uh, guiding the operations of telecoms uh, uh, operators in this area? Are you supposed to be shouldering all of this in line with the enabling law or somewhere the law is being breached and the telecoms operators have to shoulder a lot of responsibility in terms of taxes, infrastructure, and all of that that you yeah. talked about. All of us, we agree today that communications have become one of the most critical services that we require as a people, both for commerce, for security, for education, and all of that. And we have come to say that this infrastructure has become so critical to our national economy. And we believe and that's what we're advocating to come in, to classify telecommunications as critical national infrastructure and provide it the same level of protection you provide for any security infrastructure. If we do that by law or by proclam proclamation of parliament or by presidential declaration, then all those who will lock up sites will not do it again because they will, be, they will have to face the wrath of law. 
Uh, local government authorities have said they tend to go and seal up sites because of IGR will not do it again. Those who do willful damage on infrastructure because there are no consequences will not do that again. Landlords who just prevent workers from servicing site because they want to increase the rent, grand rent, will not do that again. So without this law of protection as critical national security and economic infrastructure, it would be a bit difficult. So today, the arrests are being made, people are being charged as common criminals for vandalizing this infrastructure when they find them. Um, but really and truly, it's not moving the dial. So we think that the infrastructure is critical enough for government to accord it the first level of protection. Because imagine a day without communication services, what will happen to the economy? So there are gaps in the law? There are certainly is, certainly is, there are gaps. And that's what we're part of what we're advocating. And then the second item on our statement of last week is this issue of critical national infrastructure. And we've been talking about it. Unfortunately, even in some security formation, there are times when there's, there are access problems. In some security form formation where this infrastructure are located, at a time where there are problems with access, when it's, the infrastructures are vandalized, uh, you almost you can't find anybody to talk to. So, you may have also seen on the highway, highways where uh, manhole covers or manhole communication manholes are stolen because of those who are scavenging metal elements. Um, when that happens, the infrastructure becomes exposed. We have cases where people just go and set fire on those manholes. And the implication of that is that do not only burn the connectivity in that manner, we burn an entire span of infrastructure, underground infrastructure. There's no recourse for anyone. So we face a backlash from quality of service, we be backlash from outage, there's high cost of replacement, there's high cost of repairs, and all that. But we believe that if we have some laws protecting if our infrastructure as critical infrastructure, uh, it will help in a lot of ways, particularly the primary and secondary behavior of people who impact on this infrastructure, particularly the issues of willful damage and unwillful damage. We had in times past a state governor mm. who sent his revenue agents against the operators and they sealed up sites in the states. His state being a gateway state to the northern part of the country, we had 10 states affected by the action of that state government. And you know, at the end of the day, we are told go and negotiate with the revenue agents. Absolutely nothing we can do. So let, let's go back to that issue of tariff yeah. uh, and uh, let's call it drop calls in yeah. the quality of service that Kyle had mentioned. Is this now an excuse for this poor quality of service that we've seen? I, we won't call any network, but some network has, some networks are notorious for terrible services, and we are at the end of uh, receiving the end of it. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to know whom to call uh, and who to direct your you know, complaints to. Uh, maybe you can speak to that. The, the demand for good quality of service is a fair demand. And I think what is good is good. What is not good has no other name. Um, and I, I think, as a user myself, the expectation of public for an entire disrupted services is fair. I, I, it's actually a right. But when operators face the problems that we face, um, it's difficult to guarantee good quality of service. That's the truth. Uh, in the face of all what I have mentioned, uh, it's a bit difficult to guarantee that there will be 100% availability of services. Uh, from vandalization to behavior of public actors, or even some of our behavior as subscribers and the rest of them, it's a bit difficult. And it's now more worrisome if, invest, there are, if, the, if the sector is not attracting new investment, because mm. that means that machines will go old, they will not be replaced. Exchanges will go down, they will not be replaced. Softwares will go out of version, they will not be replaced, and all of that. So there are issues that we need to look at holistically. While the public demand for good quality of services, operators demand support from government, government should do its own part. Otherwise, sanctions and penalties will not solve the problem. You can penalize operators for not meeting good quality of service in this. We can, but the fact is that in many cases, these factors are beyond your operators. If you look at numbers, FABA cost last year translated to several billions of naira. Cost of replacing that can be plowed back into rebuilding the infrastructure. If that didn't happen in the first instance, who caused the fiber? Contractors of government, road contractors, road bus contractors, who, who call the fiber locals in some cases. And these are the problems. So we don't want to see the gains we have seen in telecoms in the last 20 years. We don't want it reversed. That's why we are seeing what we are saying. So our call is not just 
increase the tariff, right. increase the rate of cost. No, without solving the problem holistically, uh, we're not going to get there. Well, we have a Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, a lot of people have said it's young, cotton edge, and uh, I don't know how much of interface has happened between you and the minister and the feedback or the signal you're getting, the NCC as well. It's interesting, you're fighting for the NCC, it would seem to be more independent. Is that what the call is? Absolutely. So you're trying to fight the cause of the NCC. But give us a sense of how soon you want this to come into place, particularly some of the uh, the issues you have raised. You say that tariff is not one of those, at, at least tariff is, shouldn't be getting as much attention yeah. as you ought to get. But naturally, that's what will get the attention of people because that's what concerns them. Right. I mean, we can't talk about security with the average Nigerian, the fiber cuts and the rest. So how soon are you looking to get these things in place so we can begin to look at a healthier telecom industry? That's why we're engaging all the stakeholders. So can you give us a timeline? Yeah. So uh, maybe Nigerians can yeah. also join. Uh, I, we, are, we, are, we are making a plea for intervention. Uh, we can't be the advocate and we can't be the judge. So we need to put this question to government. These are issues enumerated by the operators. These are their problems. Or well, let me refer What's the government do about it? How much time do we have before things go kaput, comatose? Maybe if we have that at the back of our minds, like a countdown, then we can begin to work towards it. If you this. ask me, I would say the time is now. Right now? Yeah, the time is now. Otherwise, because people are no longer investing. Given what has happened in the economy in the last months, people are no longer investing. And when the big players are not investing, system will go out of service. System will go, uh, will become of age. Um, new things will not happen. Current system will be at max in terms of capacity. So the time is now, actually. They can't be better than that now. And you see, the issue of price control, we need to be careful. Price control hasn't solved any problem. If price control will solve problem, we will not have problem we have with energy. We know how probably we have a power supply. Because in spite of the classification of zone A, zone B, zone C, I'm not sure there has been much difference. And you see, we take the problem from the end instead of taking it from the beginning. The issue is that if you don't invest in the sector, you can't talk about quality of service, you can't talk about right pricing and the rest of it. When the people in the energy sector came, you had they licensed the discourse. They sold them those companies and all of that. And everybody thought that we saw the problem. The answer is no. Because when the discourse came, they didn't invest in infrastructure. And that's why when you go to some of those substations today, it's awful. The only thing you see that are new on the network are these meters they use in collecting money. The back end infrastructure is awful. You look at the the, the transformers, some of them are 25 years, 30 years of old age and all of that. And we don't want to come to a time where the tele telecom sector become like that. So we need to continue to put the right policy in place, the right regulation in place to attract investment. And it's only when we attract investment, we can demand minimum level of performance. And this issue of leaving the operator to solve their own problem themselves, I, I think it's something that is not acceptable, actually. Government must step in at the time is now. Well, you've told us some harsh truths, one of which is, under the current circumstances, you can't guarantee quality of service, no. which is the heart of the problem yeah. for many Nigerians. But in 20 seconds, if you can, mm -hmm. I'd like you to maybe answer, you know, Cardi's question. What is the disposition of the current minister of uh, in, um, communications, communications to some of your challenges? In our view, he's doing his best. Well, you know, it's a systemic issue. He's doing his best under the circumstances. We can only join, his, join in his effort to make things better. And so we are putting the issues to him. We are putting the issues to government. We are putting the statistics across to him, to government. We are talking to him. We are talking to our regulator on the issue. They are looking at the numbers. And as they are doing the best that they can. But they can't do it alone without the support of government. So are they open to engagement? Certainly, yes, they are. All right. Yeah. There's so many other questions to ask. But I would like to thank you very much, Mr. Agwinga Dibayo, from thank the Association of Licensed Telecom Operators of Nigeria. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you.